bum butter dum Howdy y'all, Banjo Ben here at BanjoBenClark.com. This is your home to learn how to play mandolin and guitar. This week is Banjo Week, and boy, is it ever. This is one of those lessons that's going to blow your banjo mind. It's going to expand your fingers' horizons. It's going to change the way that you look at the banjo neck, if I have my way. And it's one of those lessons that I wish that I would have seen years ago, because I'd be a better player now. If I knew then what you're about to know now. Did you follow that? <laughs> you know, whenever we start to learn how to play banjo, it's often lick-based. And it should be, because you want to sit down with a banjo and you want to be able to play licks. And a lot of times, there's not a lot of energy and a lot of attention given to the theory. And we need to go back to the theory, but we can use licks to do that. In fact, I started this lesson off by playing that simple little lick. That's because there's a mountain of theory underneath that that I'm about to show you. And if you can just see that, then it'll unlock the whole neck, okay? So if you're watching on Facebook or YouTube, here in a moment, I'll ask you to come over to BanjoBenClark.com where you can join as a Gold Pick member, see hundreds of lessons, including this one. If you're watching here on the site, just scroll down and click the theory video. And after that, we'll talk about variations and then we'll spend quite a bit of time on application, how to use this newfound theory, this newfound or at least refreshed approach on real world songs. One of the things I hear most on the forum and via email from banjo students is that they want to know how to play backup up the neck and understand the theory as it goes up the neck. And they know lots of licks down low, but they might not understand the connection. That's what we're going to do today. I will say, if you haven't watched Alan Mundy's fretboard geography course, or you haven't seen Mr. G's basic theory course on the website, you need to pause what you're doing and go watch that because I'm going to, to assume that you've learned or that you've been exposed to a lot of that and have a grip on that. Um, but you know, let's go back to that very basic lick that I started at the very beginning of the lesson preview. <laughs> And I said that there's a lot of theory hidden in plain sight in that lick, and that's that's true. Um, let me demonstrate that a little bit more um, by letting you hear uh, a couple licks down the neck and then corresponding licks up the neck. See if you can you can hear how they're related. Um, this one, for instance, everybody knows this lick. Now listen to this. Could you hear the similarity? I bet that you could. Um, how about this? Now listen to this. Now I'm sure that you could hear that those licks are similar. And let me tell you, uh, the reason why I can find those licks is because I understand the theory behind those licks. So rather than thinking about four different licks, which is often what we do, we think about, okay, I know one lick and also know this lick. Instead of thinking about that as, as different licks, let's think about the theory behind them and see that really they're the same lick, they're just applied differently on the neck. And that's really cool because when you begin to understand this, like say this lick, and we say, okay, I understand that the theory is behind that. I understand that I can get something similar up here. Wow, well then now we've played it in a closed position where up the neck, we can apply that to whatever key we want to. Okay, so this is why it's so useful to understand the theory behind it because it's going to open up the banjo neck in whatever key that we want. Now, let's go back to the very basic lick because I want to break it down to its most basic elements. Uh, remember this lick. Now let's think about what that lick's actually doing so that we can pull the theory out of that. That lick's going up to a target note, up to the first string, and then it's coming back down through some passing notes and then it's landing back on the root of the chord with a little harmony note on top. Okay, so really if we think about chord positions and what this thing's doing, it's going up, and it's walking down, and come back down to the root. So if we just take the rolls out of it for now, I'm gonna leave the rolls at the door for a second. Here's what the lick really is. It's three blind mice. <laughs> or we could even play it all in the same strings. It will look like this. So now that I understand what those chords are, and those are just diatonic chord movements, which we're going about to talk about, then I can think, well, where else do, the, do I get that on the banjo neck? Oh, you get it right here. That's one place. So as we see, we get that down there, we get this up here. Same notes, just an octave higher, right? We've got the top note, top note. Next note. And then we got our harmony. Put 
those together. Okay, so what's the point in learning those chord shapes an octave apart? Well, if we know the chord shapes, then we know the licks that the chord shapes create. Oh, okay, so now this simple little lick down there at the, at the bottom of the neck opens up our mind to understand how we can begin to move up the neck. All right. All right, cool. Well, let's look at some more theory behind this. Then we'll talk about application and variations of that. Let's look at what we're doing. When we're talking about diatonic chords, where are we getting this from? Well, these diatonic chords, the three blind mice in harmony, <laughs> Those come from just the scale. It comes from finding the major scale on one string, finding the major scale on a different string, and then putting them together. That's where we get our diatonic chords. Let's just take the first string, for instance, and let's just play down a descending G scale. Let's just throw on the 12th fret for our needs today. Okay, so we started on a D note, we played down to an open D note, we played the G major scale. We, no, we didn't start on the G, we started on D, but we still played all the notes in the G major scale. Well, if you do the same thing on the next string, start on the 12th fret two, we get this. So here we start on a B note instead of a D, and we walk all the way down the scale. Well, when you add those two together, you create little diatonic chords. Those are just chords that are made by combining the, the scale notes of the same scale. Looks like this. Those are just those two scales added together. Oh, you think you might... There's even whole songs built out of playing these diatonic chords together. Now, the diatonic chords um, start with the one chord, then it goes to the two minor, and then it goes to the three minor, and then it goes to the four, five. But, but what's cool about these little two string diatonic chords is that they fit over so many chords. For instance, there in measure seven, we see that we can get our G chord there, there. We can get it all the way down here. We can get our D chord by playing this. It's a D7 here and here. We can get our C chord by playing here and here. Okay, so we don't have to memorize exactly where we get all those. I can work that into an exercise and make it fun for you, make you learn it. <laughs> That's kind of my job as the teacher, right? Okay, so let's work in it. Let's work it in a little bit. And I want to build these diatonic chords into an exercise, into a role, and then we'll show you how to apply it um, later on and how to come up with lots of cool variations. So let's start up here on this first diatonic chord. Okay, let's play it with our middle two fingers, and we're just going to play quarter notes. Then do a forward roll as we move down to the next diatonic chord position. Then down to here. Then do a forward roll. Can you do all that together? Now, maybe you've never played up the neck, but I want to remind you, all that you're doing is this. You're just doing that an octave higher. Now let's move to a D shape. We're gonna start there on our D. That's the seventh fret. And we're gonna walk down those diatonic chord patterns till we land on the next D. Now here's a trick. Can you put both those together? Remember, just remember your positions. And then we're just gonna add these rolls in. Let's try it slowly together. So if you encounter a song that has two measures of G and then two measures of D, this would work as great backup, a great filler licks. Okay, and then we can do all kinds of variations. Okay, so let's continue on because now we're going to see how it works over a C chord. Let's start right there on the fifth fret. And you'll notice that we don't follow the same pattern there. We've been going bar, 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 pattern. Here, we don't because we're playing the notes of the scale that just 
um, feels a little differently over the C. You could also do a bar here, bar, bar, and it would just give it a little blues sound. Right? Okay. And then I just wanted you to see what it looks like down the neck and measure 15. Okay, so that whole line. Okay, so this exercise uh, just serves to drill those little diatonic chord positions into our head. Okay, so you might just play through that a few times. Now what I want to do is I want to create some variations on that. Uh, I want to add some licks to it. That almost sounds like Lonesome Road Blues. I think it does. So we're going to connect some dots here. And then I also want to slow it down a little bit and see how we can do some teardrop back up with it. Okay. And then we're going to learn how to climb with it a little bit as well. And then we're just going to continue to put it into more and more practice. If you're watching on the website, you can just continue on with the next lesson video. We're going to have some fun. If you're watching somewhere else, come join as a Gold Peak member at BanjoBankClark.com. This is just a taste of what you're going to learn in this lesson and hundreds of others. Come on over.